Hi, everyone. Welcome to our final live event of the SEX Fall Series. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Miguel Rodríguez García, course lead for SE1X Supply Chain Fundamentals, part of the MITx MicroMasters Program in Supply Chain Management. So first, we want to thank you for joining us today. And since it's Cyber Monday, we are the, and we are the largest uh, online program in supply chain management, there is no better way to celebrate that by bringing you something special. Because uh, edX, the platform that we use for all of our courses, is actually celebrating Cyber Monday by giving a special discount uh, for all the courses. It's a 20% discount, and the only need uh, do, the only thing you need to do is to include the code Cyber 2022 when verifying for any of the courses. So we are actually going to be posting the code uh, here in the chat. So if one of uh, your goals for next year is to keep on learning about supply chain or even to go for the whole supply chain micromasters program that MIT has in the platform, we encourage you to purchase your courses now because the discount is only going to be available today or tomorrow. And yeah, just take advantage, uh, advantage of this 20% uh, special discount that we're giving away. So just moving forward into the live event, um, well, you guys saw how COVID-19 brought to light the importance of supply chains in healthcare and also in the pharma industry, uh, mainly in the last couple of years uh, because of the pandemic. And today what we're going to do is learn how these complex and global supply chains are managed. So as you can see, I'm not alone here. Uh, once again, I'm really proud and happy to be co-hosting the live event with my colleague, Paulo Sosa Jr., course lead for SE3X Supply Chain Dynamics. So how are you, Paulo? Can you tell us a little bit more about today's event? Hey, Miguel, thank you. Hi, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I hope everyone is excited to learn and discuss more about global supply planning in the healthcare industry. Today, we are honored to have uh, Jonathan Camargo as our guest speaker. Jonathan is the director of global product supply at the Merck Group. He has over 10 years experience in supply chain and operations in the pharma and e-commerce industry. And he holds a bachelor degree of science in electronics engineering, also a bachelor degree in mathematics, and also a master's degree in supply chain management from MIT. Jonathan is also um, a MicroMasters alum, which means he succeeded in all the courses from the MITx Supply Chain Management MicroMasters program. Hi, Jonathan. Welcome back to the MicroMasters program. Hi, Paulo. Hi, Miguel. Hi, everyone. First, I must say it's a pleasure being with you all today. Thanks you once again for inviting me to this live event. Uh, yeah, we are so happy to have you here, Jonathan. Uh, and, and before starting your presentation, uh, would you want to briefly share your professional background with the audience so um, everyone can learn a bit more about you? I think you could provide, a, I would say, a very nice overview of my, of my background. I probably will talk about a bit more about my passion. So I'm someone passionate about process improvement. I will say I'm also in love with the healthcare industry. So it's great that you invite me to this event. I hope I can transmit that, let's say, passion as well. If you want to know more about the industry, you want to know more about me, you want to create a connection with the industry, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn. So I'll describe a bit my background. So I'm an engineer, I'm also a mathematician. My experience mainly in the healthcare industry and e-commerce. In the past, I worked for Novartis, Amazon. I'm currently working for Merck. And I'm responsible for a team that is, let's say, accountable for the global supply of some biotech products. Nice, nice. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, Jonathan. I think like the topic is going to be super interesting. And I mean, it's uh, like a state of the art. Uh, everybody has been talking about in the last couple of years. So we are really... Uh, like thankful that you joined us today. So today we are going to follow uh, the next agenda. Uh, first, our guest speaker, Jonathan Camargo, will give us a presentation. It will last around 25 minutes. And during the presentation, we actually want you to interact as much as you can, and like everyone in the audience. So we are going to be launching several polls. And finally, Jonathan will be answering also some of your questions uh, for many of you guys. So we really encourage you to participate. You can use the Q&A function that Zoom uh, has available. So you can actually start 
asking questions throughout the presentation. You don't have to wait till the end because Paula and I will probably select some of those questions and we'll be asking them to Jonathan. So without hes uh, hesitation, it's an honor to have you here with us, Jonathan. Back to you, the screen is all yours. You can uh, share it whenever you can. Okay, do you see my screen, Miguel? Yes. Okay, let's get started. So before we jump into the presentation, I will try to let's say describe how I build it. So I try to, to elaborate it in three chapters. One, I will first introduce you some of the, let's say, key characteristics of the healthcare industry. What are some of the trends? What are some of the watch outs and, and what makes the industry special, right? What characterizes really this industry? Second, I will move more into global supply planning. So what is the role, for example, of a global supply planner within this industry? What are some of the key constraints that need to be considered for supply planning? And then third, I will give you some, let's say, concrete examples of the decisions that typically are taken by a global supply planner. So what is really the job about? How, how it looks like in the daily life? What are the type of interactions a global supply planner have, right? So, so let's get started with the, with the first piece of the presentation, which is about the healthcare industry in general. So we'll just create this, let's say, framework before going into details of global supply planning. So let's just start with a quick overview. Healthcare as an industry, I would say it's, it's, it's a big industry. And within the industry, there are many sectors. I've seen that some people sometimes have confusion on the different sectors. I tried to, to put in the slide the, the four key ones, the main ones. The, there are also other sectors within, the, sectors within the healthcare industry. But the four key ones I would say are pharmaceuticals, uh, biotechnology, medical devices, and digital health solutions. I have noticed, and, and, and actually I, I was in the same group, I typically was creating a confusion between pharmaceuticals and biotechnology. Like what is the difference between that? But based on my experience, I can simply, let's say, summarize it in, 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 in quite a, a very basic way. So we say pharmaceutical is mainly related to medicines that have as a basis, a chemical principle, right? So typically it's a chemical formula that you can somehow, somehow easily replicate, right? When it comes to biotechnology, the basis is a living organism. So this is how you build your medicine. It's a bit more difficult. So this is more to say already, biotechnology as a sector is a bit more as a specialized one. And it's a one which is more difficult to enter, okay? When it comes to medical devices, it's also a big sector actually. But to, to bring some clarity about it, just think about the type of devices that typically are given to a patient to facilitate a treatment, right? So it can be a device to track the treatment, if it's working well, if it's performing well, or if there's any particular watch out the patient needs to be aware. So think, in, think about it in, in that sense. Digital health solution is mainly about, I would say software solutions, also to support treatments to patients, okay? With regards to, to trends, there's one that is quite specific to this industry, and, and it's the first one mentioned in the slide. The one related to increasing regulatory and quality requirements. So this is the first message you need to get out of this presentation. This industry is super regulated. So there's, I would say there's no flexibility that you can do something if you're not complying against regulation. Right, it's not that you can try to find a creative idea to overcome regulation. No, forget about that. If you do that, you will put, you will be putting your company into trouble, big trouble. So first thing, keep that in mind: regulation. And there's an increasing trend in regulation. It's like many industry, right? There's always an, a higher a, a standard on how to operate. In the in the part, in particular in the healthcare industry, this higher standard means more restrictive regulation and quality requirements. There's also, uh, I would say, two other trends that are quite common across many industries. Sustainability, the use of machine learning, artificial intelligence. I would say especially on sustainability is something I'm trying to focus on now, following my experience at MIT and, and my master's in, in supply chain management. There's a lot of, I would say, of 
big focus to make our supply chains more sustainable. But what, it, what makes it difficult in this industry? Regulation. So for example, you want to redesign your product to use more, let's say, sustainable materials. Well, not, that's typically not something you can do. Somehow, typically, you need to consult health authorities. OK, so keep that in mind. Even if you want to make your supply chain more sustainable, some things you can do, but not everything. Typically, keep that in mind. Consulting health authorities is, is the best recommendation here. So what are the key constraints, let's say, dictating the way uh, this industry operates? The first two I already shared, regulation and quality requirements. With regards to more, let's say, product specific requirements, I would say chef life, it's, it's a big one. In certain, let's say, markets, you need to meet chef life requirements dictated by health authorities if you want to be able to sell a certain product. Right, so it cannot be that, for example, you ship to a certain country product with um, predefined pretty, pretty, pretty chef life. No, in some countries, there's also some rules you need to satisfy with regards to product chef life. Then it's characterized by very long lead times. So I, I give you the example of, of, bio, of the biotech industry. So the biotech industry, the manufacturing of a biotech product, it's, I would say, consists of three steps. The drug substance manufacturing, which is your, the manufacturing of your active product ingredient, transforming it into drug products. A drug product simply is having your active product ingredient into a vial or a syringe. And finished product, which is taking those vials and those syringes and packing into a finished box. This, this somehow are the key three manufacturing steps describing, for example, the, the process for a biotech product. And I can tell you it, it takes almost one year then to end the time for this process. So it's quite a long one. Of course, to overcome that, there are different decoupling points in the supply chain. At API level, especially under pro manufacturing, typically the, these are two decoupling points that are used, of course, to overcome these long lead times. And the last point of this uh, industry in terms of constraints, the hard barriers to entry. Regulation is not something easy to meet. Typically, you want to build a manufacturing facility to be able to manufacture, for example, a biotech product. This is something that can really tell you years. I would say three to five years. Okay, just building the plan, validating it, and ensuring it fulfills regulatory uh, requirements. Last but not least, if you are in a supply chain function, of course, you also you are also accountable to ensure that the way you plan supply compliance against regulation and quality requirements. So it's a must. Every function operating, let's say, working in this industry need to comply against regulation and regulatory and, and quality requirements. So let's, uh, let's say, start with a, a first question. So I think, Tani, you can help me with the first one. So what is the common end-to-end -end manufacturing lead time for a biotech product? So here we have uh, three possible answers. I guess the answer is quite easy because somehow I already shared what I was speaking, uh, two months, four months, or 12 months. I think we are good to go. Let's see it. OK, so 12 months, 82%, that's the right answer. So let's keep that in mind. It's three manufacturing steps, API, drug pro, finished product, one year, more or less, end to end lead time. So very long lead times also compared to other industries. OK, let's move forward to the next section of, of the presentation. Now we'll move from the, let's say, healthcare overview into global supply, what it means in, in this industry. So to, to try to somehow explain it in a simple way, I just build a very simple supply chain here in this slide. It's, it's not that simple, of course. I put it also like very linear, right? Not to just, again, just to keep it simple. And I will try to explain 
where global supply planning is involved. You know, because in, in this sector, global supply plan is not just about generating supply plans. It's really about interacting with many functions before building those supply plans. So let's have a look to, to the simple supply chain. So as usual, everything typically starts with the sourcing of raw materials. So you have many suppliers globally that are shipping those, let's say, raw materials to, to manufacturing locations that afterwards are processing those, those materials and transforming that into API, drug product, finished product, and then shipping that into, into a distributor. Then from that distributor, typically the product is distributed to wholesalers, and then the demands coming from clinics or pharmacies are fulfilled from those wholesalers. So very simple supply chain, but what I wanted to share is more the involvement of a global supply plan in, 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 in that supply chain. So first thing, like many industries, is this decision with regards to supply planning parameters, like which safety stock levels to have, a which transportation mode to use, for example, to ship product from one country to the other, uh, how volumes are allocated across the supply network, and under which location uh, you would like to place a certain supplier. So those are typical decisions that are connected to global su supply planning. But here, what is very important is that typically you, are not, you don't have the flexibility to decide them alone. You need to work with many functions, especially regulatory, quality, and commercial. Again, you need to ensure that whatever you decide is compliant, right? If you are in a non-compliant situation, this creates significant trouble for the company you're working with. So for example, transportation mode, right? Typically, you can select between airplane, a boat, uh, or truck. Okay, that's a transportation mode, but is the, is the transportation route validated? So this is the type of question that are common in, in this industry. Can you ship, simply ship one product from A to B with a track? Well, you need also to ensure that your road is validated. You cannot select every single road for that. So now what it means more in details. So I just focus now on the on, on, on MPS, master production scale. So if you have some supply chain experience already, you will know that typically it's about generating supply plans, right? Quantity, what needs to be produced, when, where. Well, what are some of the key inputs to generate that in, in, the, in the healthcare industry? So demand, as usual, sales forecast, customer orders. But also here, I have a key point, which is Chevrolet requirements for sales. If you want to operate in certain countries, again, it could be that health authorities might ask you, here you have a customer order, but you need to guarantee a certain product chef life. For example, once the product enters the country, you need to ensure 18 months remaining chef life. So this is a must. If, for example, you want to operate and sell your product in that certain country. What are other key inputs are actually common in supply chain? So like lead times, available capacity, frozen and planning horizon, uh, what is the status of your inventory? What are the scheduled orders? So all that is, uh, let's say, typical information uh, you find that are required to, to run your supply chain. Um, then what it, when it comes to more specific, uh, I would say, constraints on this industry, I will take the example of manufacturing site registration status. For example, you can have three manufacturing sites, manufacturing facilities, all capable of producing vials, okay? But then you cannot simply decide to allocate product volume to a certain location unless that location has been registered towards health authorities. So the, the line, your manufacturing line can be ready, capable to run as of tomorrow, but if, if this manufacturing line is not registered against health authorities, you cannot use it. 
So keep that in mind. All those constraints, is, I, I always tend to think about it. It's like supply chain, but in parallel, you have all the regulation. So you always need to do the, the mirror reading of, of what you decide, what it means in terms of regulation. So what is a typical output of global supply planning? So which a product that uh, product ABC that needs to be produced by week 12, 100 units in manufacturing line four, which is located in Italy. And what is different is which process. Also everything related to, to regulation. You can have the manufacturing line four in this example registered uh, to, to health authorities, but it doesn't mean you can actually use it. Sometimes, even if a manufacturing line is registered, you also need to decide which process will be used to manufacture that product in that, in that line. Because also processes as such are subject to many changes. And those changes also need to be approved by health authorities. Okay, so to manufacturing vials, you might have three processes available, but you also need to check if process-wise, those are registered. Otherwise, you cannot apply them. So it's, it's a bit tricky in that sense. And, and I would say this is the main watch outs and, and somehow where the complexity lies in this industry. Now, I, I suggest to go to the, to the second question. So I, I will read it. So let's assume you have a line called XYZ that can manufacture uh, lot sizes of 100,000 vials. But this line, however, this line is registered for all countries, right? So regulatory wise, this manufacturing line has been registered to all countries, right? So you have the approval from health authorities to use this manufacturing line. But it has been registered with a manufacturing lot size maximum of 80,000 vials. So remember, the line is capable of producing 100,000 but it was registered against health authorities with 80,000 vials maximum. Then what is the consequence if you produce a lot size of 90,000? So option A, 90,000 will be written off. Option B, actually you will use 80,000 out of those 90,000 produced and the 10 other thousand remaining will be written off. Or option three, you will be able to use the 90,000 vials that were produced. While the audience is answering to the poll, I just want to remind everyone that if you have a question, um, you can share with us by using the Q&A feature. At the end of the session, Jonathan will be addressing to some uh, of the questions that we get. We already have some questions here, but if you did not share, your, uh, share your, yours yet, you can do it right now. Okay, let's see the answers. So 62% uh, reply 80,000 units will be used and 10,000 units will be written off. So actually that's a wrong answer. <laughs> the correct answer is option A, 90,000 will be written off. So you see, this is how, uh, why this industry is so constrained in that sense. Remember, regulation is your top priority, and you need to comply against that. If you register a manufacturing line with a maximum loss side of 80,000 vials, you cannot produce 85 or 90. No, it's not a proof. It's not registered. So forget about it. You will scrap it. And it's not that you can split your lot. No. If your maximum lot size is 80,000, this is the maximum you can produce. Now let's move to the third chapter uh, of, of this presentation, which is about decision-making and mainly what are the key, let's say, trade-offs uh, a global supply planner needs to play with in the, in the daily job. So there are three, I would say, indicators that are typically part of the objectives of someone working in global supply planning. So first, service level. Uh, which is mainly referring to product availability, being in stock. Uh, second indicator, it's about cost. So how do you supply your product with which cost? 
and inventory. So how much inventory uh, you are holding throughout the supply chain to maintain a certain service level, for example. Um, I must say, as I shared during the beginning of the presentation, now there's, uh, uh, I would say, a very interesting trend on sustainability. And now I see that uh, the carbon footprint of a product is also now becoming part of the decision-making process. So sometimes not just about taking a decision, thinking about service level, but it could be also taking about the decision, thinking about service level, but also what is the related carbon footprint of that decision. So it's, it's a very, I would say, important indicator that soon will be part of this triangle. I don't know how, if it will be in the center or how, but it, it will be part of, of the decision-making process. One thing also about this industry, typically between these three indicators, service level is their top priority. There are many sectors, as I mentioned, pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, medical devices, etc. But service level is typically the most important indicator across the different sectors. So you always need to think about who's the end customer. And in the industry, it's a patient or an animal as well. It could be, yeah, depending how, um, on, on which sector you're operating, but typically it's a patient, right? So you do, what, one of the things you would like to avoid is of being a stock out and having to stop a treatment for a patient. So that's very important. Typical service first, that's the priority. Also because in certain uh, countries, for certain medicines, if you go with stock out, you have to pay penalties to health authorities. So pharmaceutical companies, biotechnology companies, in certain countries need to guarantee the product is always available. So what are some of the, let's say, trade-offs or some of the decisions that, that are taken? So in the, in the first example, for example, what if you decide to produce just a small quantities enough to meet the market needs? without considering production efficiencies. So in this case, for sure, you will have a very low inventory. So you're producing just a small quantity. So your cycle of stock will be low. You're maintaining service level because you're meeting what the market needs. So you're supplying what the market needs. So no, no reason service. But the issue here is cost. Because you produce small quantities, you will be, let's say, generating cost inefficiencies for the manufacturing sites. Right, you will be able to absorb, let's say, you will not be able to properly absorb some of the fixed costs of running manufacturing lines, which typically I can tell you are, are quite high. So this is some of the trade-offs typically a gloss about is to think about when deciding which quantities uh, to, to produce. Second example is the com it's, it's on, on transportation mode. What if you decide to switch the transportation mode from air to sea? Why? So in this case, and, and while keeping service level, uh, let's say stable, so service is maintained, cost normally will go down because if you have enough volume and if you are able to fill, uh, let's say ship containers, normally it will cost less than shipping the same amount by air. Uh, but on the other hand, your inventory will go high because whenever you ship by sea, of course, as you can imagine compared to air, your transportation lead time is much higher. So your inventory will normally go high. A third example, it's about reducing safety stocks without considering demand and supply variability. Okay, you reduce your inventory, but if you have high demand variability and supply variability, you will hurt your service. But soon you will be facing a stock out and this will trigger cost, either penalties to health authorities, I was mentioning before, or because simply to compensate uh, the fact that you're going to stock out, you will be activating some, let's say, express shipments. So there's always a, a trade-off, of course, on, on those decisions. Now, I suggest to move to the next slide, and I will start it. I will start it with a question. So in this example, uh, assume you have a factor. There's a factory in France where you are packing the finished product, right? And you need to decide the transportation mode to ship that product from France uh, to China. So there are three options. You can ship by air, you can ship by sea, or you can ship by rail. 
In this slide, I'm initially showing uh, only part of the information. What is the related cost per transportation mode? This cost includes the transportation cost. So how much you will pay your transporter to, to effectively move this inventory from France to China, plus also the inventory holding cost. So the, invent, the, the, whole, the, the cost you will pay uh, to carry that inventory while the product is in transit. So if you do that calculation, uh, and you, in, in this example, I came with these three numbers. So in the case of air, it costs 2.4 million euros. In the case of C, it costs 0 0.8. And in the case of rail, it costs 1.2 million euros. So my question is, and I think we can now raise, the, raise it in, in the group. If you, will, if you need to decide the transportation mode, to shift this inventory from, from France to China, but you want to optimize your inventory. So remember, there are three indicators, service, cost, and inventory. Here, the question is about optimizing inventory. Which option would you choose, air, sea, or rail? Okay, so let's have a look to the results. So to optimize inventory, 52% of the attendees reply error. Error is the correct answer. So you want to optimize inventory. Here you will go with the transportation mode that have the lowest uh, lead time. So normally shipping by air has a lower lead time. France to Spain could be a couple of days. If you ship by sea from France to, to China, it can easily take for a pharmaceutical or a biotech product 45 days. And if you ship by rail, it's more or less one month. So in this case, definitely you want to optimize inventory. Shipping by air will be the one, let's say, generating the lowest inventory impact in this case. So this is the inventory. Uh, and, and by the way, this is a, a real example. So this is the inventory value related to each transportation mode in, in this example. Air, as I mentioned, more or less a couple of dates. So the inventory you will be holding on, in that situation will be more or less 0 0.3 million euros. If you ship by sea, it's more or less 4.5 million euros. And you ship by rail, around 3 million euros. So you want to optimize inventory, definitely air is the best option. Even though is the one that costs the most. Right, but the question was optimize inventory. And then here I added a third column, which is uh, CO2 emissions. So as I mentioned, now this is getting a, a lot of attention in the industry as well. And some of the decisions are, are as well starting to incorporate the CO2 emissions impact. In this case, shipping by air is probably the, the less environmental friendly option. It generates 3.5 tons, while C is the one generating the less let's say, uh, amount of emissions. So here you can see it's a tricky question. What would you choose? So typically, this is the type of decisions a, a supply planner needs to, to take. And I will say the decision is also somehow driven by the strategy the company wants to, to follow. OK, so this was my, my last slide. So thank you, everyone. I, I hope that, that you find it useful. For the ones that are attending SCX course, I think you have noticed that typically at the end of each presentation, there are always dogs, but I like cats. So this is why the reason I decided to put a cat at the end. So thank you. Now I'm, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Jonathan, um, for such an insightful presentation. It is definitely a, a, a really interesting topic. During the last um, three years, the importance of healthcare global supply has become crystal clear to the world, right? Especially considering vaccines production and, and distribution. Um, Jonathan, you, you highlighted to us that supply chain professionals need to be knowledgeable on regulations. 
And it's not only about calculating inventory levels, optimizing a distribution network, or selecting the best transportation mode. It is also essential to understand and comply with regulations related to the supply chain, because at the end, um, they will somehow impact your inventory levels, your network design, et cetera. And in SE3X um, Supply Chain Dynamics, which is one of the courses of the MITx Supply Chain Management MicroMasters program, learners are studying this right now. Actually, they are preparing, preparing for their final exam next week. And they are studying about um, the impact that regulations have on the supply chain. So um, before jumping into the, the audience questions, I'd like to make uh, to ask something to you. Have you ever faced a situation in your professional career on which there was a disruptive um, regulation change that suddenly impacted your supply chain? And if yes, how did you handle that? Okay. So I would say commonly there are no disruptive regulation, right? Because health authorities, proactively inform companies about it. And by proactively, I mean minimum two years in advance, right? So that companies have enough time to find a solution to let's say modify their processes or implement new processes to be able to comply against those, uh, let's say new uh, regulatory requirements. I would say the, the challenge here is where you don't, properly manage that also, this is where the disruption comes. Like for example, health authorities inform you two years in advance by, I don't know, 2024, you cannot uh, use any more animals for drug substance testing, as an example, right? If you sleep and you do anything, you will have a disruption. Because also, as, as I mentioned, there are very, let's say, the long, there are le the lead times to, to change your processes are quite long. So in this case, for example, avoiding using animals for drug substance testing, this is something you need to tackle immediately somehow. So you need to modify your process, think about how you will modify it because also, let's say, changing it is not something straightforward. Typically, when you do a process uh, modification, you also need to validate the new process. By validate, I mean somehow qualify the new process. So do some manufacturing runs, gather some data so that you can prove as authorities. With this process, I will be able to comply against the regulation. And even when you're able to do all that, still you need to formalize it with a, what, what is called a submission package. So you prepare all your documentation, you provide all the data to health authorities. And then after you submit all that documentation, there's also a waiting time. In some regions, it's four months. In other regions, it's even two years that you provide all your data to, to health authorities. And so you need to wait two years to get their answer if they approve what you submitted or not. So this is probably where I see mainly the risk if you, are, if you don't proactively manage those changes in regulation, you will have disruption afterwards. Well, that's really, really interesting, Jonathan. Thank you for, for sharing. I think now we can go to some of the questions that our uh, learners and any other people from the audience have. Um, I think, so Jonathan, I think you can stop sharing the screen now. So everybody can actually like, see us when we like answer to like the questions, if that's okay with you guys. Uh, yeah, that's I think that's perfect. So uh, I'm gonna read like one question uh, by Alex Bay, uh, and this person is asking like, what does validate a shipping route or a shipping lane mean? Uh, and I'm gonna actually follow up on that because uh, like I, I also kind of like I don't know in my mind uh, try to imagine how this validation process happened, uh, and it's actually like really interesting to me to think like. How often does it happen? For example, how often does it get updated? Like, oh, you do want to validate a road because you want to go from Madrid to Paris or from LA to New York. Like, who do you have to reach out to to actually be able to do it? Because I guess, I mean, this kind of regulation crosses borders and you have many different countries uh, like mediating there. So like how this uh, works in, in the industry. Yes. So it's... Um... 
a world, let's say, about uh, routing validation. Uh, I will I will take an example to try to, to explain it. Let's assume uh, this, this example I was sharing before about finished product manufactured in France and you want to ship it to China. Let's assume the only validated route uh, you have is uh, ship it by airplane and you want to validate a new road. You want to ship it now by train, okay? So how do you do that? So typically you go to your quality function, ask them what needs to be done to validate this road. And they will tell you, okay, you need to produce 300,000 vials. So that's a requirement in terms of quantity. Let's put it in the train. The road that we would like to follow is France to Germany, Germany to uh, Ukraine, Ukraine to um, China. Let's assume that, right? And uh, to be able to guarantee that this route is validated, typically what will be done is that they will be placing some uh, loggers to monitor temperature inside the train. Because what you need somehow to demonstrate is that the fact that you're using a, a rail to a, a train to transport your product is not damaging the safety or the efficacy of your product, right? So you collect data and you can and you demonstrate the product efficacy or safety is not changed. You're able to demonstrate that with data. This is how you validate your route. Here I give a bit of um, of extreme case. When it comes to truck transportation, it's much more easy than that. So by that, I mean, if you validate a road between France and let's say Bulgaria, that data you can also, let's say leverage to demonstrate to health authorities that shipping from France to Spain is the same. Thank you. Um, you're on mute, Miguel. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan, for clarifying that. I think it's uh, like really interesting because we don't see this kind of validation, in, I guess, many industries. So thank you for sharing. Paulo, do you want to yeah. like select another question from the audience? Yeah, yeah. We have another question here. Um, it's an it's really interesting. So my, uh, it's from GK and it says, thank you for the webinar session. My question uh, to Jonathan is if he can share his experience of supply chain management micromasters program. What worked for you, Jonathan, and what did not work? Uh, any suggestions for the current students? So I guess uh, this person wants to know how the program has helped you in your professional career. I would say there are two, two things that I think have shaped a bit my profile in the last years and my focus areas. So first thing, when I entered this industry, so I learned about all what I, what I share here. And I was always afraid, okay, regulation first, uh, service level to patients first. And it was, I, I'll say I found difficulties to optimize the supply chain, right? Because I, say, oh, I, I always need, I am always so constrained by regulation. But I think, um, uh, where the MicroMaster helped me was to see problems in a different way. I mean, you can really actively contribute to make your supply chain more efficient. For example, there's another trend in this industry that I did, I did not mention, but now there's a lot of pressure on cost and profitability, right? And there are certain decisions that are not directly related to regulation. For example, you can decide with a revised version of the economic order quantity model to better plan the volumes uh, you're allocating uh, across the manufacturing facilities, right? So typically in manufacturing slides, you have a minimum and a maximum but side that is, let's say somehow validated and registered, but within this range, you can play. And this is where I would say the knowledge I get from the, from the MicroMaster helped me because by building, let's say simple models, still complying against regulation. And within that range, I was able to find solutions to better optimize cost, for example. So I think those models, those, let's say, uh, structures, ways of thinking differently about problems is what helped me. The second thing, uh, more directly 
uh, learning I have from from the from the masters directly, not the micro master, but the masters on sustainability. This is um, an area where there's a strong focus, but I would say few people know what to do exactly. <laughs> so there's a good willingness to contribute, but people don't know how to. And, and in this industry with all these constraints, it's even a bit more difficult. So I think also from there, I, I gather some keen sides that I'm today applying to my, into my job. So I, re, I, I don't know if you remember the triangle that I presented, service, cost, inventory. I'm now working on finding ways to incorporate the carbon footprint into the decision-making process of that triangle. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I think uh, also now in the MicroMasters, sustainability is has been included actually, not, not only in the main um, program, the residential program here at MIT. Uh, actually, there is also a, a course that is uh, the our center, Center for Transportation and, Log uh, and Logistics is launching um, on edX, and it's actually focused on supply chain sustainability. So if anyone wants to check it out, that we also have colleagues working on that too. So of course that, that's going to be uh, like the future of everything, not just supply chain, but we we need to be sustainable and, and keep on working in that direction. So we still have a bunch of questions from the audience and we, we don't have much time left, but Jonathan, if you're okay, maybe, maybe we can uh, like ask you a uh, last uh, question. Um, if you allow me, actually, I'm going to ask two really short ones. So if you can answer them and then we can finish the uh, the event because we have a lot that, and they're really interesting all of them we are really sorry that we cannot read all your questions guys but uh we are constrained so the first one is from uh, amy lee and she uh, this person is asking you like the uh, current uh, state of the pharma industry in terms of like the resource limitations that you might have coming from china or india because we are seeing again uh like COVID and also like other kind of supply chain disruptions in, in Asia happening. So if you just want to like mention how uh, you're dealing with that. And the other one is about something really interesting because we have been talking about regulations a lot, um, but we don't know how, like how far this goes throughout the supply chain. So when you have different suppliers in terms of like tier one, tier two, tier three, usually that's a manufacturing uh, language, but I guess in, uh, in the farm industry, you also have really strong supply chains and long supplies. So actually regulations, how far they they go and how you are constrained by that. So yeah, first resource limitations nowadays and, and regulations throughout the supply chain. If you can mention or talk a little bit about that, we really appreciate it. I would say it's a big, big challenge. <laughs> so it's not only well, impacting the healthcare industry, of course, it's impacting, let's say, uh, many industries. I would say the key words in, in, in the healthcare industry is dual sourcing. It's always saying, and customer is a patient, you want to ensure your pro is always available. So the way risk, risk mitigation is handled in this industry, I would say it's also, it's done in a very robust way because normally you will not have, let's say one single supply, for example, based in China. No, normally you will have a supplier in China, and another one in Italy. You also diversify a bit the, the, the location where the suppliers are located. Having a disruption in this industry can put a company in big trouble. So again, the, so, sometimes there are commitments against health authorities and it's something you want to avoid, let's say, not fulfilling. When it comes, uh, let's say, to the cases where you're only single source, if you have, a supplier in China. Also here in Tesla risk mitigation, typically there's a big amount of safety stocks that are carried. Okay, so uh, compared to other industries where probably sometimes there's a lot of pressure on, on inventory, let's say keeping inventory uh, low, let's say. In this industry, it's somehow acceptable even to have very low inventory turnover, okay? as long as you're securing your supply also in those cases. So it will not be strange for a raw material even to have one year of safety stock. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing. Paolo. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Jonathan. I see here that we are um, right on time. 
Um, so I want to thank you, Jonathan, for such a great discussion about global supply planning in healthcare industry. We still have many questions here. Unfortunately, we are not able to address them right now. But thank you so much, Jonathan. Jonathan, it was great to have you today. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you, Miguel. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. And of course, everyone who decided to join us today. Uh, it's been a super insightful session. Um, before we say goodbye, we just want to remind a couple of things to everyone. Because uh, first, uh, we still have several SEX courses uh, open for enrollment for next year. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there is uh, we're celebrating Cyber Monday and edX is giving away 20% discount off. So if you want to take advantage of that, uh, of that, you can use the code CYBER2022. Uh, we have it posted on the chat if you want to check it out. So you can use it to register and verify for any of our courses. And also, this is the final live event of our series and between SE1X and SE3X. So it was a great pleasure to co-host the, all these events with Paolo. Uh, we've tried to bring you, I don't know, real insights from the industry. We hope that you've learned from all of them. I think we did it. And yes, thank you again so much for, for tuning in. And yeah, uh, finally, we cannot forget our learners because you, I mean, you have SE1X final exam and SE3X final exam coming really soon. So best of luck with that. And yeah, thank you again, again for joining. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Jonathan. Have a great week, guys. Goodbye.